There we are. Bye. Hi, everybody. It's Jane Johnson with the Briar Hill Group at Remax Comosin, host of Vancouver Island Time and co-host of He Said, She Said, They Said with... Hello, I'm Andrew Plank, co-host of He Said, She Said, They Said uh, with Jane Johnson. I'm Andrew Plank with Royal LePage. And we have today Jen Lowe. Jen, would you like to introduce Hi. yourself? Hi. Good morning. Good morning. So what, uh, what company are you with, Jen? Oh, sorry. I'm with um, DLC Modern Mortgage Group. Okay, that's the Dominion Lending for those who want to. Yes. Know. I was going to say, have you, cha have you changed? I thought you were with Dominion. <laughs> yes. Sorry, yeah, Dominion Lending. Right on. Okay, Andrew, you want to share the um, stats for this week? We're going to go right into stats. Okay, so just give me a sec here. We'll pull this up. And should be... For you guys. Is it, is it up? No. Okay, we're still having our... That's weird. It takes some time. There it goes. There's like a huge delay, but we've got it now. Okay, so net unconditional sales up to May 10th compared to May of last year were 259 compared to 457. So what's what's your uh, prediction there, Andrew? Uh, well, I still think we're going to be um, moving towards like a bit of a slower summer, but um, and uh, you know it's it's interesting that we have less sales. Uh, well, of course we're not <laughs> too far into May yet, but. Um, yeah, I think we're going to be moving to a bit of a slower summer. But uh, that being said, um, I don't know. It, it, it's really hard to tell. Everything is up in the air right now. Okay. Well, last year we were in the middle of COVID, right? So yeah. I'm expecting we'll probably have about 800 sales. That's, I think that would be around normal. So I think we're on track for that. Mm -hmm. Looks like it. Yeah. 365 new listings uh, so far this month compared to 1,095 last month for the whole month. I think a lot of people have been waiting to see what happens with uh, the vaccines and COVID. Um, we've had people listing all throughout the, the pandemic, but people are starting, I, I believe there's a bit of a, let's wait and see what happens going on. Um, so that's, that's one thing I'm noticing with that. Well, also uh, we have a big announcement coming with uh, stress test and all of that. So mm -hmm. that I think will affect things. Jen can talk to us about that. Okay. Yeah. So active listings we're up. Wow. Almost 1500. Yeah. yeah. Every, every month, every week, every day, we're kind of bumping up a little bit more listings. Yeah. That's great news. It yeah. is. Yeah. And I'm seeing more price reductions, which we'll get into. Um, I'm seeing some prices that are just frankly seem to me ridiculous. And I think maybe, um, there are new, there are more listings coming on, which we see in every market that have um, that scatter of, you know, really reasonably priced that sell really quickly. And then, um, sorry, really well priced that sell really quickly, reasonably priced that sort of are on market for a reasonable time in this in this market. That's about a week. <laughs> and uh, and then the overpriced listings that, are, that sit around. Right. But there's more of those. So new listings. 312 pending 242. So we're way down from our one to one ratio we were at mm -hmm. just like six weeks ago. Yeah. And um, what you were saying about the ridiculous prices, we have 54 price decreases. So that says to me that people are going, hey, you know, like probably sellers are wanting to sell where people were lit, um, selling previously. But um, just speaking from my own experience, I have two listings on the market. One's probably priced a little bit high. And one's priced reasonably. The reasonably priced one, we're getting a lot of showings, and I'm expecting multiple offers today. Nice. Well, we look forward to hearing about that. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's 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 sorry. It's interesting to see the um, that light green line, the price decrease to 54. It's a much much bigger line in comparison to new listings than we have seen in quite some time. Yeah, and I think it just goes to say that uh, you know, as realtors, we don't always set the price. We're negotiating price at the listing and we're negotiating price at the sale. So uh, just pe people should understand that the sellers have a say in what the listing price is and they may not always take our advice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So actually, how was your week last week? My week? Great week. Yeah, really busy. Um, uh, quite busy. Uh, ended up... Um, removing conditions on a place. I've got a new listing that's getting a lot of activity. 
Um, a lot of active buyers still really, you know, searching for homes. I'm really noticing guys that um, there's a lot of places coming up. And again, I, I'm seeing prices that um, it's a bit of a scatter shot on prices, but prices in the core versus prices a little further out. I'm starting to see a lot more divergence in the quality of product and the price point, which sort of suggests to me that things are going a little bit off off the rails is maybe too strong a word, but people are, um, it's almost more randomized where, where prices are going. I think people are trying for a lot more, a lot more money than they were in the past. And I'm also seeing a lot of, uh, properties that weren't getting the same kind of activity in the past, getting a lot of activity. Like when I'm making showing requests, I'm seeing, you know, no, no windows for showings, uh, for certain properties and other properties, they're just wide open. Okay. So, um, you're speaking in lots of generalities. So let's just, um, can you take, I can, let's be specific. So can you take down the share thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So, uh, what do you mean exactly? That there well, so, okay. So a property in, let's say Fairfield for 1.3 million, um, listing that looks like a pretty standard looking home in Fairfield versus, you know, I've got a listing, uh, two acres, almost two acres in Brentwood Bay, really, really beautiful custom home. Uh, it's getting lots of activity. Um, but I can tell, um, you know, from feedback and so forth, that it's not getting the same kind of activity that I think a, a property might, uh, attention that a property in Fairfield might get. I mean, location is really important, but uh, when I look at the, the the core fundamental of, you know, the land you're getting, um, the value of the home, I just seem, uh, it feels to me like there's a, uh, a lot more divergence. I don't know how to describe it better than that. I think it's a totally different buyer though, because like, uh, like, uh, um, who you're going to get moving into a, a house in downtown Victoria is going to probably be a young family who doesn't want to, uh, you have two cars and yeah. they, they probably want to walk everywhere and they, they consider walkability score really important. Whereas the person who lives in the country is probably likely to um, want to, um, you know, mm -hmm. grow their own vegetables and, yeah, true. Be a part true. of the 4-H club. Yeah, true that. Um, I just do feel like there's a bit, there's a lot more, there's a lot more divergence. That's all I'm, I'm that's all I can say. Well, so I, I have a listing coming up in um, The Chosen that has a very steep driveway. Mm. And, um, so I said to the seller, like when we list this, you just have to understand that this is a very important factor. Like a lot of people consider <laughs> getting up and down the driveway a very important factor we're gonna to have to be careful when we price it just so that it's appealing so that people over overlook that so i don't know i i found um what happens is when the market contracts exactly what you're saying so you see less sales happening further out and then uh the core still remains hot yeah. and it's like a flame right yeah, exactly. Yeah, concentric rings as it as it expands and contracts. Yeah, and that's what I'm sort of that's what I'm saying. I'm seeing a little bit more uh, contrast between you know properties that are listing and selling in the extremities versus properties that are listing and selling in the core price points um, and just general activity and desire. So let me ask a quick question. Yeah, is, is there statistics or around like when you price a property for a seller? Um, in, in them taking your advice on recent sales, not properties currently listed in determining what that price point is and driving that price up for uh, multiple offers versus trying to list it higher. Like a, like a percentage yeah. of how many properties are selling above the asking price. You so see, you see what I'm, I'm asking? Yeah. <laughs> at, at our, our sales meet, we have a, a, a realtor in our office, Leo Speltzholtz, and he does a, a real estate blog called House Hunt Victoria. And he does a he does a report to us at our sales meetings. And he actually looked at exactly that. Recently, he looked at, you know, do you benefit or not benefit by underpricing your home and mm -hmm. setting it up for multiple offers? And he found that um, on the whole, setting up for multiple offers, you don't lose, you generally 
tend to win. Um, you tend to get more money higher. Uh, sale. Yeah, then then press then going higher and hoping for that that one buyer that's gonna bring the higher offer or hoping that you get offers based on that higher price point, you actually end up usually selling faster and for more money by actually in this kind of market by by pricing lower. So what I do, Jen, when I'm looking, let's say uh, a single family home with a suite in Happy Valley area, um, I look at the range of <laughs> so you, so you would do stuff like putting your criteria like four to six bedrooms and two to three bathrooms and two, double car garage and all of that, right? Then yeah. what you do is uh, I sort it by price and I look at where is the price listed and where is it selling so this would be um list like linear linearly list sale list sale list sale mm -hmm. and ones that were uh if it's from lower to higher sales here where you see at the one point you see where there's a listing and you go the sale is lower the sale is lower the sale is lower so you see there's a there's a cusp which is kind of like the, the the market value. So let's say the list price is 1.2 million. At 1.250, everybody's selling at 1.199. And at 1.99, they're selling at 1.250. So there's a bit of a, you, you begin to see like, oh, you know, like this is where the activity is hot till. And then mm -hmm. after that, it kind of like the sales start to spread out. and yeah. and. The, where you you realize, oh, okay, you're overpriced. And I guess it's, I mean, it's a constant moving target. True, so. it is. Yeah, you want, you, there's, it's kind of like, yeah, it's a constant moving target. Everyone's always sort of saying, well, that was where the last sale was, I wanna go here. Mm -hmm. That was where the last sale was, I wanna go here. And not only that, the buyers are also, you know, have been traditionally looking at the last sale, saying to the realtor, how much do I have to bid to win this? we advise this is where the sales have been. Do you really like this home? Yeah, I really like this home. I really want to make this work and I'm tired of looking. Okay, well, this is what most of them are selling for. You have a good chance of winning it. This is the value. Okay, well, I really want it. I'm going to bid higher. And then the market goes higher. And so what we're doing yeah. now with some of my buyers is, Jen, we're actually looking for homes that are overpriced because we figure that the sellers will now expect less than asking because they can sit on the market. So that so whereas before people were what happened was everybody was pricing at market value. Now there are some people who are pricing higher, which is what Andrew was saying. And mm -hmm. so the buyer's not going for it. So now we're looking at houses that are up here because we know that their strategy is probably to list high and, and negotiate. And so uh, you know, we're able to get some money off. Oh, brilliant. And then, and then I guess you can look at the days on market for how long it's been on the market. Huh. Great. And not everybody gets offers, even though they thought they were set up to receive multiple offers. And as Jane referred to, we don't always set the price. So people sometimes list a home saying, I want to set up for multiple offers and I want the top dollar. And I think I'm going to get above that. And so then offer day comes and there's crickets and tumbleweeds blowing by and no, nobody's calling you. And um, and so the the property's still on market. And then a week later, uh, in this market, if you've been on market for you're you're an old stale listing after a week. <laughs> People assume it's sold, and they're not calling you because yeah. they just assume it's under contract, and they're moving on. So yeah, you that's that's where it's that's where there's some opportunity if you can circle back on those. So what's um, happening? Yeah, so I just want, I'm just pulling up an example because I, um, there was an agent who listed, oh, this isn't the same one. Never mind. <laughs> well, so there, I've seen examples of this where someone lists a home for sale. Uh, they overprice it by accident or by purpose. They don't get offers on the offer receipt day. And then, so they do a price reduction and they do a dramatic price reduction. And then the next thing you know, they end up in multiple offers and they get the price they were originally asking. Yeah, it's weird. Where it is really weird. Yeah. It's like, it's. I think it's because what happens is, let's say you're pricing like a, for a single family home. 
um, you're pricing at a million bucks, which is mm -hmm. the average house price now. And so people will be like, oh, well, you know, they're expecting multiple offers, then they won't offer because the whole financing, as you know, changes over a million. Mm -hmm. Then they offer, like, then they reduce the price to eight ninety nine, and they get like six offers, and one of them is one point one five or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because once you're competing, you know, people know they have to pay all kinds. Um, our networking group had a meeting on Friday, and one of my colleagues was was relating a listing. I viewed this listing um, on Sanit Road. They got ninety over ninety showings on this property. And it was a good pro. I mean, it had been updated. It was a seller's own property. He was he had fixed it up and had been living in it, but now he was selling it. And they have had over ninety. Realtor, hmm? the realtor, Which realtor, Mitch Litstone. Okay, but it was you said it was a seller's own property. It was a it was a realtor's own property. Okay, yeah. Anyway, over ninety showings, three offers, only three. And I think it's because it has such activity. I think people said, you know what, I don't. I don't think I have a chance. <laughs> is, there so, any, is there any discussion about the blind bidding going by the wayside or? Yeah. Yeah. Lots. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, actually Jane, um, I was just reading this morning, two execs from Remax are actually suggesting the two top execs from Remax. Apparently it was, a. Uh, I don't know who they are because I just scanned the article, but they're recommending uh, this, you know, if Canada get away from, blind bidding. But there's a problem with that because if we go to auction, um, you know, no two buyers are alike. You know, Jen, as you know, you know, the vetting of the buyers, the, the financing, financial position of buyers. If I'm looking at just numbers in an auction, um, I don't really know if these buyers are going to be able to come to the table with the money at the end of the day or, if, mm -hmm. you know, so I just don't know how an auction would work, but, but there is the blind bidding thing is, um, is, is problematic for a lot of people. I think it's also pro problematic because just focused on price. And, and I know that uh, we were in a multiple offer situation last week and we won based on um, the fact they liked our buyers. How did they like your buyers? What did they like about your buyers? What was it about your buyers they liked and how did they know about your buyers? These things that they liked. Tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do a video, a song and dance? Do you have a very nice letter? <laughs> they liked our, our offer. <laughs> In the States, they're really careful about, um, you know, outing the buyers, because if a seller selects a buyer based on some sort of criteria that could have to do with fair housing, um, it, it can be really problematic as well. So... It's really I, complicated. What I did was I, I disclosed um, to the sellers what the deposit was. And uh, we did have a condition. Our only condition was financing, but they needed an appraisal. You mean, well, you said deposit, but you mean, because deposit would be on or the contract. So you mean the down payment? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, that's a good strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So you said, okay, we've got like, you know, this is a, this is a million dollar property and we've got $600,000 to put down something like that yeah, Which I, says to the seller. Okay. Yeah, he's anywhere. File. Yeah. Or strong, yeah. strong clients. Mm -hmm. yeah. like, because like, I don't know about you, but I classify buyers. Like there's a plus buyers. Woo, you want them. And then there's like your C, which you think it, hopefully it'll go through. Sorry, Jane, I, I see all buyers equally. <laughs> I mean, when you're a listing agent, so you have to ask questions. Mm -hmm. You have to understand what the risk is. And I, I always say to my clients, you know, what's the chances? These folks have written a really nice letter um, and they seem really wonderful. But what are the chances they're going to be at the finish line on closing day with the money? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's talk about what's happening, actually. Yeah. Um, actually, I want to know. So if somebody gets pre-approved now or they get an offer now with this new stress test coming that's coming in, first of all, what is a stress test? And can their offer be, you know, bumped off off the rails if the rules change? Yes. Um, the um, so the change to the stress test is that the qualifying interest rate 
is increasing from 4.79 to 5.25, but only for people with more than 20% down payment. So it's not changing anything for first time home buyers with less than 20% down or anyone. You don't have to be a first time home buyer to have less than 20% down. So any, if you have less than 20% down, you still have the qualifying rate of 4.79. Why is That's that, weird. Why the change in that direction? I don't get it. No one really knows. Honestly, it's an interesting move because who is it going to affect is really the uh, small area of people that it will affect are those that um, sort of middle class, um, uh, relatively higher income earners or that have got a good nest egg that are looking to get into their um, first home or, you know, with, with at least 20% down. So it's reducing those people's purchasing power by about four and a half percent. But if um, with a conventional mortgage and you have more than 20% for a down payment, um, bank lenders are able to, um, you know, we're able to um, obtain an exception if they have um, investments, high net worth. There's lots of programs already in place for those that can't qualify based it, on that. Is it, is it to stop people from buying investment properties, maybe? I don't, I don't know. Like it, the government, unfortunately, has put in multiple um, I mean, they brought in the foreign buyers tax. They brought in the speculation tax. All these things that they're trying, we're trying to cool the market, and none of it has worked. Mm -hmm. So, as it stands right now, and I, I belong to a lot of mortgage broker, you know, uh, forums and groups, and it people are really not clear on what the plan is here with this. Um, it's going to create a bit of panic. Um, and it will affect a small group of people that are just trying to squeeze in with just 20% down and they don't have substantial savings. Um, but for the majority of people that have at least 20% down, they're not um, just squeezing in. Okay, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So you have a buyer who... Previously, they wanted to avoid CMC. Yes. So they 20%. Yeah. And, and, and they qualified at 4.75. Yeah. 4.79. Yeah. Now, those people are going to put down 19% and pay the CMHC penalty so that they'll qualify under. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or the other thing is, is that you it, you can qualify when you have 20 percent down your maximum amortization or here i'll take a step back so if you have 20 percent down you can qualify under the cmhc rules and pay an insurance premium and then and then you would qualify at the 4.79 and what is the premium though like let's say on um a million dollars um, well, yeah, because then you got to think of all these other maximum pieces, right? Where you've got it has purchase price has to be under a million for um, using CMHC premiums. It would be the premium would be two point four percent of the mortgage amount. So twenty four thousand dollars, and for five hundred thousand dollars for a condo, mm -hmm. how much would the premium be? Oh, I'd have to look it up. But it'd be, it'd be if you were putting 20% down, 25-year um, amortization. This is why I'm not a mortgage broker. <laughs> you know, it's funny because in our, in, our, in our real estate courses that we had to take so many um, generations ago, uh, it was all math and mortgage financing and had nothing to do with anything we do in our real estate course, our real estate lives in, in, in reality. But. We should know all this stuff, but it's it's in our memory banks far, far, far back. That's what I'm here for. Um, Thank the you. premium, the premium would be ninety six hundred dollars. 
Yeah. So it's interesting. Jane had a good point. I was thinking similar. Like, so if someone, um, you know, is under a million dollars and um, doesn't qualify with the new under the new regime, they can they could choose to go high ratio, and um, they would qualify for more, but they would have to pay a little more because they'd be paying CMHC fees. Um, if they are looking, if they are someone who is looking for an investment property, as Jane alluded to. You're going to need to put 20% down for an investment property. Uh, okay. So you're not going to be doing CMHC. So you are going to have to qualify for higher. Or if you're buying above a million dollars, um, any property above a million dollars. So it's really affecting people who are, you're shaking your head. Am I wrong? No, you're right. I'm shaking my head because I think it's uh, I think it's a poorly thought of policy. I'm agreeing. Yeah. With yeah. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. The K, they call it the K economy, right? And they're trying to help these people who are at the lower end, but um, I don't think it's helping them. No, yeah. it, I mean the the people that have already established wealth with real, you know, with real estate or have investments and stuff like that. It's not going to affect them at all. It's affecting the people, like you said, that are have saved up, just gotten that twenty percent down wanting to put it into um, real estate and now they qualify for 4.5% less mm -hmm. unless we can mitigate and look in, in looking into their um, financial situation. If they're self-employed, finding a lender that has a program um, where we can gross up their um, income by up to 25% or, um, you know, they have child tax credit. They've got, you know, three children and they get the child tax credit and that income may not be used by the lender, but we could get an exception to the ratios because um, we know they have that additional income. So I'm sure many, many of us, like there's a lot going on with what you just said. And I think the, the core of what you just said is even though we might on the surface have been told by the government, this is what the rules are. And we might as a, if you were out there as a buyer saying, I don't think I can afford this because of this change. The bottom line is talk to Jen because there might be some other options available to you. Yeah, I my you know, in my job, I'm asking as many questions as I possibly can to get the full picture and make sure that I'm not missing any potential income they're earning. Um, any, you know, lots of people, they'll say, well, I just have this job. And I mean, I've been making, you know, um, pottery, uh, but it only earns me 5,000 a year. Or, you know, well, you know what? Sometimes, especially in these, in now in these situations, that can make the difference. Right. Absolutely. So I'm just thinking maybe what they're trying to do is put pressure to, on the lower end housing to, for us to lower the price by like 5%. It's just not going to work that way though. No. Yeah. And we don't set the pricing. And it's not going to affect the supply. Like they, they, they've proven, unfortunately, it's been proven that all these extra taxes and stuff that they brought in, that they were trying to um, um, lower the demand, it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. No. And, and when they do eventually make some change that does impact demand, it'll probably be right at the point where demand is already cut off. <laughs> It'll just kill the market entirely because <laughs> that seems to be how it works. It's a little bit too little until it's too much. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen with interest rates overall this year, Jen? Um, on the variable rate side, I, I mean, my thought, I mean, they can't go further down. They will eventually increase. Um, but um, as the Canadian government, everything we do is, you know, when they change interest rates, it's very cautious. They make a change and then they see the effect of that change. So um, the outlook um, on the variable rate side is that it's supposed to remain low into at least the end of 2022. Um, on the fixed rate side, we've definitely seen a bit of increase um, up to 2.09 to 2.29%. Um, for the fixed rates due to the bond market. But um, I mean, it's still extremely low. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just so you know, I'm coming up for renegotiation. 
And my yes. Husband, Jesus. I totally well, you know, that one. It, it's so hard. I, you know, I think of actually that often that logic at that time, fixed rates were lower than the variable rate. So logically in your head, you go, okay, well, no, like, why wouldn't you take a five year fixed? However, statistics show, and they've always shown that the variable rate has outperformed the fixed. And that was a perfect example that over time, <laughs> it really has outperformed the fixed, right? Like, yeah, it dropped one and a half percent in a matter of six weeks, I think it was. The, the prime rate. So, so there, what, go ahead. I was just. There was a. I'm. I'm really curious about um, negative interest rates because I know that um, was it Germany or there, some Europe. There was some negative interest rates at some point. I don't know if it's still happening, but how does that even work? And is there any chance that's going to happen here? Um, you know, people say, "Oh, interest rates can't go any lower," but you know, I've heard of in negative interest rates. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that. We've been told that, no, there's no way the Canadian economy will allow or the um, federal government will drop interest rates into negative territory. Um, prime rate, um, that's uh, it's set by the overnight lending rate, and the overnight lending rate is a quarter point, so 0.25%. So right. we are extremely close to that zero mark, right? And they've kept it at the 0.25% uh, now for over a year. It was, ch it changed last March with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So there was some fear and some economists were, you know, negative rates might be coming and, you know, but no, it's been definitely shot down that no, that's not happening. And frankly, our economy has actually been stronger, way stronger than what they expected um, right. from the pandemic. I as can be seen by the housing market, which nobody, uh, very few people I think predicted what to see 30% rise in housing prices during a pandemic. Yeah, right? Yeah, so. Okay. The other thing that the federal government has come out with a program, actually it's been around for a few years now. Um, the website's called A Place to Call Home. And we really haven't utilized the program much because honestly in Victoria, Victoria, Vancouver and Toronto, um, when they when they put out these national programs, quite often our you know buyers aren't able to fit within the program um, due to house prices being above or you know the criteria it doesn't work. But interestingly enough, um, they've increased and it today was the um, uh, first day increase the qualification of the program so what it is is that the federal government will um, basically lend first-time home buyers only um, five percent they'll match your five percent down payment but you are um, in essence um, sharing ownership with the government so that when you sell your home you are giving a up five percent of the market value of that time at that time mm -hmm. oh, wow it's a, yeah it, it's not what it, what it will do or the what it does is it um, I pulled up an example um, it lowers your monthly payment by about two hundred dollars a month uh, based on a purchase price of 675 um, so your monthly payment decreases from 2,600 to 2,400 and it drops your CMHC premium by about $8,000. So that's, there is some benefit, okay. yeah. but you are giving up 5% ownership in your home. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But it's 5% ownership you may not have had in the first place if you couldn't have gotten it. You know, like if you're getting 5%, if you're getting 20% more home for giving 5%, I don't know. I Yeah, it helps from a cash flow. Sounds like a reverse bond where yes. the government's investing in you. Yes. Mm. Actually, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, so based on a purchase price of 675, 
your minimum down payment would be 42500 The government would match that to increase your down payment to um, $8,500. Um, and then you're giving them the 5% ownership. Um, the qualifying income increased to a maximum of 150,000 annual household income. Previously, it was 120,000. And um, the total borrowing amount increased to 4.5% of your annual income, and it was previously 4%. So it's made it, you know, like maximum, maximum based on 150,000 income, um, the maximum uh, mortgage amount would be 675. Can you can you tell us the name of that program again on the website, please? For anyone it's called uh, a place to call home, mm -hmm. and it's a federal yeah a federal incentive program. So I've got a buyer who's looking for a place for you know her and her son. Um, she's been building up her down payment. Um, she sounds like she might be within all of those parameters. Um, it might make sense for her to be able to get, you know, shelter where she's been renting and is just really, you know, the value of, um, you know, sharing 5% ownership with the government versus not having something and continuing to rent might mm -hmm. be strong value there. Also, you know, um, you know, 100% of nothing is still nothing. And if you're waiting, you know, a couple of years to buy a home uh, versus getting a home now, sharing 5% with the government may not be such a bad thing if property values continue to rise, you would have, you'd be in a better position than, than if you waited to actually save up the down payment you require. Better than being in a relationship with a bad person. Yeah. yeah. At least you know the, the government yeah. won't make a mess. <laughs> um, I have a- uh, I guess everybody's got their own judgment about government versus good versus bad, but I, I get what you're saying. The, the catch is too is, you know, you, you can't refinance like there's a lot of fine print to the program that's important to consider and look at um right it's true that you know if you go with a five-year term five years goes by pretty quick and people forget that they signed up for this program and then they either they sell they don't you know they don't let the broker at the time know that um they had this ownership program they could be in for a really not so pretty surprised when they know, when they find out how much they have available for their down payment towards the next home. Well, it'll Wouldn't probably show up in their title though. They'll yeah, be I was say title yes, it would. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my thought based on, on the announcement that this is going to be, going to be happening, this, this change, I think there's going to be a little bit of a rush on purchases over the next, few months. What do you think, Andrew? Every, every time there's a change, if it's an opportunity, it'll make a bit of a rush. Yeah. It'll open up some extra, um, extra income, extra money or extra, extra activity for sure. Um, you know, positives bring a little bit of a bump and negatives bring a little bit of fear and then people get over their fear and move on. So, I mean, we, lots of things happen where we think the sky is falling when there's a governmental change for the negative And then, um, people go back to business as usual after a few weeks or months. Um, I think the, you know, and the other way around as well. Um, people say, oh, there's a great program. Let's, let's look into this. And even if they don't use the program, maybe they are now suddenly thinking about real estate. There's a bit of a rush. And then again, people go back to business as usual. Yeah, I agree. Everything sort of yeah. reaches its equilibrium. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm going to ask Danielle if she is with us to please, do you want to give us your contact information, Jen, if people want to get in touch with you? Yeah. My phone number is 250-217-4925. Uh, um, email address j.lo at dominionlending.ca. And my website is uh, jenlo.ca with an E after the L-O-W. Okay. Jen, J-E-N-L-O-W-E.ca. Okay. And oh. Right. Andrew, what's your contact info? Uh, um, you can reach me at info at andrewplank.com uh, or call me at 250 360 6106. Happy to, happy to talk. And Jane. 
You can reach me. Thank you. My name is Jane Johnston. I'm with the Burr Hill Group at Remax Camosun. My number is 250-744-0775. You can email me at briarhillgroup at gmail.com or visit my website at briarhillgroup.com. Just remember, every Monday we're going to be talking about real estate here on He Said, She Said, They Said with Andrew and I, and we'll be having guests as we go along. If you have a topic you want to uh, for us to discuss, please email me or Andrew, and um, we look forward to serving you. Thank you so much for coming, Jen. We really appreciate yeah, it. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Jen. Nice well, to see you. Thank you for having me. Okay. We'll get, we'll get your contact information updated. Have a great week, everybody. Oh. Thanks. Oh, there it is. Already done. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, Danielle, you can press end show. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs>